Welcome, my name is Joshua. In the 1970s, there was a famous television show called The Partridge Family. You may have heard of it. And it starred a man named David Cassidy, who at the time was quite the teen heartthrob. And David Cassidy enjoyed all of the things that most people desire. Fame, fortune, and good looks, and um, travel the world, and so forth. Well, David Cassidy passed away a couple of years ago, and his daughter released his final words to the public. Four final words on his deathbed, and those were, So much wasted time. So much wasted time. What a sad and sobering set of words to reflect on. Now, time is the most valuable thing you or I will ever have access to, and it should go without saying, without time, we have nothing else. It is through the proper use and application of time that we acquire anything else of value, so it behooves us to take diligent stock of how we spend our time and how we intend to spend any future time we might be so blessed with. Now, this was birthed from a place of personal exhortation, as I sought to be more deliberate in my own use of time and to attempt to account for as much of it as possible. Every minute, even if possible, that might sound extreme, but bear with me. And so inasmuch as I've tried to exhort myself, I pray that this exhortation to you will be of some encouragement. Uh, Lord willing, there will be something of value in here for you. A brief study first, followed by some practical applications and suggestions. Psalm chapter 90 and verse 12 says this, So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Teach us to number or prepare our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Yes, it's wise to prepare your days or to number your days even as your days have been numbered for you. Your days are numbered and you don't know what that number is. Prepare your days, number your days, acknowledge that there is a limit to them. And that's the first point I want to make is to be aware. Be aware of your time. And I say your in quotes because it's not yours. This is God's time. Now, it's an easy concept to articulate and slightly more difficult to understand fully, to really digest that you are not living on your time. It is God's time. This is a stewardship you have been given. Now, everyone is given unique talents, abilities, and resources, and so forth, but there is one talent common to all humanity, and that is time. We all have time in common, and it's up to you how you utilize that talent of time. It is through the proper use of time that we cultivate our other talents. Be aware that it is God's time that you will give an account of. You will give an account to God of how you used his time. You're just a steward. So be very mindful of the vaporous nature of time. James tells us in James chapter 4, not to boast about tomorrow. You don't know what a day will bring forth. What is your life? It's even a vapor that appears for a moment and then it's gone. Now he's not decrying planning, but rather saying to plan without presumption. Plan tempered by the knowledge that God reserves the right to revoke time at will. It's his time, and he can revoke it at any moment. Uh, Jesus gives us this parable in Luke chapter 12 of a rich man whose barns were filled with grain, and he said, I'll tear down the old barns, and I'll build new barns, and I will say to my soul, Soul, you've made yourself wealthy. Eat, drink, and be merry. And God said to him, you fool, this night your soul will be required of you. He didn't know that his time was up. And neither do countless millions of people. If you're so blessed, you might see your death coming from afar off. But for most people, there is a very sudden and abrupt translation from the realm of the temporal to the realm of the eternal. People don't plan for heart attacks. They don't plan for car accidents. It's rather abrupt. Be aware that it is God's time and be aware of the fleeting nature of it. You don't know how much you have. 
Jesus, being our model and our example in all things, was very aware of his time, even from a young age, age 12. We're told in Luke chapter 2, his parents lost track of him at a feast. They go back to look for him, and they find him conversing among the teachers. And they said, son, why have you done this to us? See how anxiously we have sought you. And he said, why did you seek me? Didn't you know that I must be about my father's business? Well aware of his time, even from age 12, and how he was to be spending it. You read things like, my hour has not yet come, or my time is at hand. Jesus was constantly aware of his time and how he was to be spending it, which brings us to the second point, be deliberate. So be aware and be deliberate. Jesus was very deliberate, very intentional in all of his dealings. He did not live a life of caprice with a back pocket full of contingencies. He was very measured in his approach and he planned his interactions in advance. He said, should I say, God spare me from this hour? No, but for this very purpose came I into the world. Knew exactly what his purpose was, what he was there to accomplish, and the trajectory he was to take in achieving that. In John chapter 4, there's this very peculiar passage. It says he needed to go through Samaria. He needed to. Why did he need to? Well, we find out that he had an appointment with a woman at a well. He needed to go there. It wasn't an accident. He planned to go there. He needed to. She was to come under conviction for her adulterous lifestyle, be introduced to the Messiah, and then go back and tell her village to come meet Jesus. Jesus planned this in advance. It was not an accident. It wasn't an afterthought. This wasn't a work of improvisation. He needed to go through Samaria. Similarly, he has an interaction with a man named Zacchaeus, a short tax collector, a man of short stature. Zacchaeus couldn't see Jesus. He wanted to get a better look, and the multitudes are thronging, so he climbs a tree. Jesus sees him, and he says, Zacchaeus, make haste, come down, for today I must stay at your house. I must. Not an accident. This was an intention. I must stay at your house. What happens? Zacchaeus repents in his own living room and says, Lord, I will restore to anybody who I've taken from, and so forth. Jesus was very intentional in his dealings. How did he redeem his time? By Ephesians chapter 5 of an often quoted verse or set of verses, verses 15 and 16. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time for the days are evil. Jesus redeemed his time by walking circumspectly. What does that mean exactly? To be circumspect is to be deliberate, to be intentional, to be precise, to be accurate. To be circumspect is exactly what the wise men were uh, told to do by Herod. Herod, talking to the wise men about where the Messiah was to be born, says, When you have found the, uh, diligently search for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word. That term diligently, same idea. Same word. Diligently, accurately, with precision, search for that child so I know exactly who I'm looking for. To be circumspect is to be intentional, to be very deliberate. And above all, be devotional. Above all else, be devotional. It is under the umbrella of devotion that all other aspects of time management are aligned. If you do not manage devotional time, you might as well not have anything else managed correctly. Jesus' entire life was marked by devotion again. Back to this episode when he was 12 years old. I must be about my father's business. So marked by devotion was his life that his disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. Why did they say that? Well, at one point he sent the multitudes away and he went up on a mountain to pray. And there he was alone. In Mark chapter 1, we read in verse 35 that he woke up, he rose early in the morning while it was still dark. And he went to a solitary place to pray. Whether alone on a mountain or in a solitary place praying, Jesus' entire life was one of devotion to God. Be aware, 
be deliberate, and above all else, be devotional. Devotion being the chiefest thing. The most important aspect of time management is devotional time. But what does this look like practically? How do we actually manage our time practically? For different people, this will manifest in different ways. Some people work graveyard shifts in prisons and hospitals. Other people have newborn babies and so forth. And so time can be an elusive thing. And because of its elusive nature, we need to plan. We need to live lives of circumspection. That's where it rises or falls is on the basis of how well you plan. This is how you manage your time. You plan to manage it. You budget your time. You ration your time. You diet your time. And it has to be very intentional or it will inevitably be wasted. You know, you get a check if you work at a normal job. You know what your hourly rate is, and you know how many hours you worked, or you know what your salary is. In any event, you know how much is owed you. And they're kind enough to tell you how much they've taken out for taxes. And so you can account for every dime and every nickel of your earnings. Can you account for every minute of your day? Well, that's a tall order. Maybe a little rigid, right? Well, not if time is more valuable than money. And it is, because without it, you don't have money. But it's it's easier to think of budgeting our money diligently than it is to think of budgeting our time diligently. And it's more important to manage your time. You, you receive a check and you budget accordingly. For most people, there's there are certain priorities that, they're, that are budgeted for. Usually, housing or shelter is at the top of the list. Utilities, food, and so forth. For most people, the most important thing is securing their housing, their shelter. Might I suggest to you that your devotional time is the equivalent of a spiritual shelter. And if you don't properly budget time for devotion, you might as well be spiritually homeless. Would you spend your rent money on chocolate bars? It would be foolish. Neither should you allow some other thing to take your time from devotion. It's the most important thing. And if you're halfway wise, you know how to budget your money. Shouldn't you be more diligent in budgeting your time? Absolutely. Know where it is going and how it is going there. And... Preparing yourself for a productive day begins the night before. It starts with sleep. Now, for thousands of years, people have been contriving new and creative ways to get out of sleep. It's an understandable endeavor and a futile one. Study after study shows that the average person needs about eight hours of sleep, seven to nine hours. This is consistent across the board. There are exceptions. Some people can get away with six hours. If you can, more power to you. But that is very much the exception, not the rule. Generally speaking, people need eight hours, and rest is important. If you're sleeping three hours a night so that you can gain an extra five hours during the day, you're going to be a walking zombie and unproductive. You might as well have slept the extra five hours and been clear-minded and healthier as a result. So rest is important. Don't love sleep, but don't neglect proper rest when you can get it. If the Lord burdens you with prayer a particular night, by all means pray. But when you can, you should get proper rest. You will be the better for it in every other way. And if you have access to this 5 or 6 o'clock hour in the morning, I would urge you to seize it. Because in a very practical sense, they are the best hours of the day, especially for devotion. It's quiet. It's a serene time of the day. You're not likely to be bombarded with calls and text messages and emails and so forth. It is just practically the most peaceful time of the day. And you will see 
whether it's ministers of yesteryear that you might admire or successful businessmen, there is a very common theme of early risers. Even Jesus, Mark chapter 1, he rose while it was still dark and he went to a solitary place to pray. It is the time of the day when you're least likely to be interrupted and therefore it's the best time to consecrate to the Lord. Uninterrupted time just for him. Now, if your schedule doesn't permit to be up that early, then adjust accordingly, but you see the point. Find that time, make that time, and if you have access to the early quiet hours, take them. And in order to seize those hours, you have to go to bed at a decent hour, at an early hour. If you want to wake up at 5 a.m., you should make it a point to get to bed by 9 p.m., which is not always easy to do. might be something you have to learn to do. Setting yourself up for a productive day starts the night before. Sleep is important. Rest is important. Going to bed at a decent hour is important if that's what you want to do, depending on your schedule. Now, if you work nights or something like that, adjust accordingly. I had a roommate years ago. I used to think he was a little crazy. And the more I look back on this, the more I realize I think he was onto something. He had a to-do list on the refrigerator. I kid you not. This is not an exaggeration. It looks something like this. 5 a.m., wake up. 5 a.m. to 5.10, exercise. 5.10 to 5.12, brush teeth. 5.12 to 5.17, make breakfast. I am not joking. There was a time slot for brushing his teeth. And you might say, well, that's rigid, that's a little aggressive, that's over the top. It might be a lot of things, but here's what it's not. It is not irresponsible. I cannot fault him with not being able to account for how he spent his time. I can't. And the more I think about it, the less fault I can find with it. Really, what's the harm? What's the harm? Being able to account for every minute of your day? Most of us would do well to heed something like that. Now, I'm not suggesting necessarily that you schedule your teeth brushing time per se. But there are some people, depending on your lifestyle, depending on your habits, depending on your mindset, that might be exactly what you need. Maybe down to those minutes. For other people, that's unnecessary. And there are certain tasks, and you can manage brushing your teeth without writing it down. You get the point, though. The more structured or the more scheduled you are, the less room for impulse, the less room for random things to waste your time because it has been allotted, it has been apportioned, it has been budgeted properly. You ever go shopping without a shopping list? I have. What a horrible shopping plan. You know what happens? I'll end up leaving with things that I didn't need and forgetting things that I did need. Not to mention wasting time in the process. If you go in with a list of 10 items that you have prepared beforehand, you know exactly what you're looking for. You get in, you cross them off the list, you get out. Your money is budgeted, your time is budgeted. It's a better way, it's a more efficient way to go about things rather than just meandering around the aisles aimlessly amending your list in your head on the fly, getting distracted by this, leaving and inevitably forgetting something that was important and going away with something you didn't intend to get in the first place. Impulse will take over. Impulse thrives without structure. That's how it goes. People that are on diets that are eating healthy, they do it by acting intentionally. You don't just get healthy by doing nothing. You have to be you have to make a deliberate conscious effort to be healthy. In the same way that gardens don't weed themselves, they must be weeded, and neither will your time manage itself. It must be managed. People don't lose weight by not doing anything. Or they don't maintain a, a healthy eating style by not being deliberate. Generally, what they'll do is they will plan their meals in advance. They'll plan, for Tuesday, I'm going to have chicken and broccoli, and for Wednesday, I'll have whatever it is. But it's by planning those things in advance that the possibility of a donut entering the equation is averted. 
because they've already planned the meal. They've already purchased this, and because they purchased this, they didn't purchase that. Because they've already prepared this, they have no need for that. There's less room for the impulse. But if this isn't planned, if the meal's not planned, it's an impulse field day. If you don't have your meal planned, then you go looking for something. Oh, that sounds good. That looks good. Of course it does. Of course it sounds good. Of course it looks good. Bad things generally do. Bad food tastes great. And your impulse will take you there. You have to be intentional about these things. You have to be deliberate. There's less room for impulse. Nobody gets in a car and just starts driving to a destination without first charting the course. You decide on a destination, and then you chart the course. If you don't do that, it's a recipe for calamity, and even worse than shopping without a list. What a horrible, horrible travel plan. What route are you going to take? Is the road closed? Are you driving in the right direction? Of course, you find the destination and then you figure out how to get there. You don't just start driving. You avoid a lot of problems by investing a little bit of time planning beforehand. By planning, investing a little bit of time planning, you avoid a whole lot of time trying to correct mistakes that could have been avoided in the first place. Not to, mention, not to mention being vastly more productive. Setting goals in general. If you want to read, for example, you can read through the entire New Testament once a month, depending on how your Bible is formatted, by reading about eight pages a day. That's it, eight pages a day. You can read a new book every month if you want to do that. It's a very doable task. Here's how it won't happen. By not budgeting the time specifically to do it, it will never happen. If you just say, I'm going to read at some point tomorrow, you might do that a day or two, but it, you will not be consistent. Rather than if you said, every day at 9 o'clock for 30 minutes, from 9 to 9.30, I'm going to read this book for 30 minutes. That's how you will accomplish that task. And if your goal at the end of the day, as it should be, is to say, <clears throat> everything I've done today, in word and in deed, I've done in the name of the Lord Jesus. And to the best of my knowledge, I have redeemed the time that he has given me. I've invested it well for his glory and my good. You can more confidently say that the more structured your life is, the more planned in advance it is, the more accurately you can account for those minutes. And you can account for them accurately by planning them ahead of time as much as is possible. And so by saying yes to certain things, you must say no to other things and be resolved to do this or to do that. And it's helpful to look at the world, um, worldly successes, as a source of inspiration and rebuke. Jesus tells us in uh, Luke chapter 16, the sons of this world are more shrewd or wiser in their generation than the sons of light. Absolutely true. Observe business successes in this world and see how well their time is managed for the pursuit of earthly things. Uh, Richard Baxter, in his paraphrase, uh, which he went to prison for writing, has a note here, Luke 16, 8. His note says this, Oh, that we had as much wit and care and diligence for our soul's everlasting welfare as false worldly men have for this vain world. Indeed, false worldly men have a lot of care and wit exercised for this vain world that we would do well to take note of. You can see this in the professional athletics world and the entrepreneurial world. These success successful men manage their time very well. There is a man named Alex Honnold, a phenomenal rock climber, who is a renowned free soloist. A free solo is to climb without a rope or without a safety harness. And he climbed El Capitan in Yosemite, which is a 3,200-foot granite rock face. That's two Empire State Buildings stacked on top of each other. Massive sheet of rock. He climbed it in about four hours with no ropes. One of the 
most impressive feats of athleticism in human history, without a doubt. How did he do this? By managing his time well. And managing it with this end in mind. Not to mention meticulous choreography. Talk about circumspection. Literally every finger hold and every toe hold was choreographed with precision. He planned for over a year climbing this over and over with ropes, knowing every nook and every cranny, literally, so that he could climb this thing without a rope. Impressive. An impressive accomplishment by almost any standard. And yet, in the light of eternity, it's meaningless in and of itself. I'm not saying this to disparage Alex Honnold. To my knowledge, he's not a Christian, or he's not doing these things for the glory of Jesus. And while it's impressive, it's ultimately meaningless in light of eternity. This is a goal that ends with climbing the rock itself. That's the motivation. Or, you know, building up self or self-glorification. Look how much energy, look how much diligence goes into climbing a rock. Take a guy like uh, Mark Cuban, for example. Billionaire entrepreneur, very well known. Why is he successful? Well, in large part due to his time management. Guys like Mark Cuban or Warren Buffett or Bill Gates are very, uh, they manage their time very well. They have set schedules, and when it's time for answering emails, it's not time for jogging. They don't allow other things to encroach upon their schedule. It is by maintaining this schedule that they become successful in their worldly pursuits. And that's with the chief end of making more money or glorifying self or whatever the goal is, at least to my knowledge, the stated goal is not for the glory of Christ. Now, you can be a successful Christian in business, but to my knowledge, the examples listed are not Christian men. And yet, most of them are better manage their time than the average Christian. And if they can exert that much diligence for the end of an eternally meaningless goal, how much more ought we to be motivated to steward well the time that has been given us by the God of the universe? And don't lose an opportunity to redeem so-called mundane moments. Perhaps in your schedule in a given day is washing clothes, a relatively mundane task that can and should be an act of worship. I'm not saying that just because it's the right thing to say. I'm saying that because it's true. You have an opportunity while washing your clothes to give thanks to God for his provision. And when that relatively mundane task of washing clothes is done for the glory of Jesus, it becomes infinitely more important than climbing 3,200 feet of granite. That alone But learn from the sons of this world. They manage their time well to pursue things that will die with them. O oh, vanity of vanities, whose things will they be once they're gone? Somebody else will acquire their wealth. Rather, store up for yourself riches in heaven. Be rich toward God. And see how these men are so careful with their time to pursue things that are ultimately meaningless insofar as they're not done for the glory of God or inspired or motivated by God. And so there's some things to beware of. Start here. Beware of that. Beware of your phone. Beware of becoming a slave to your phone. I had a friend in high school. I could never get a hold of him. When I would see him, I'd say, I tried calling you several times. His standard reply was, Josh, I'm not a slave to my phone. Touche. Not a slave to my phone. Now, the internet is amazing in that you have access to the database of human knowledge at a moment's notice. And the internet is awful in that you have access to the database of human knowledge in a moment's notice. Quite the double-edged sword. There is a lot there to rob you of your time. And having access to everything, while it can be a useful tool can be a trap. You don't always need access to everything all the time. And especially the social media outlet, 
be very careful with social media. It can be Facebook and Twitter and things. These can be tools used for good, for meaningful interactions, for sharing the gospel, for communication, for all these things. They can be legitimate tools for good. And they can also be, and very often are, life-sucking spiritual vortexes. Be very careful. Most of you probably immediately know what I'm talking about. These are petri dishes for useless wranglings over words, needless contentions over genealogies and so forth, the things Paul admonished Timothy to avoid. Profitless disputes thrive in the realm of social media. Absolutely profitless. Have you ever found yourself aimlessly scrolling through Facebook in this oddly voyeuristic realm for much longer than you anticipated? I'll tell you how it happened, at least in part, because you didn't plan that time. You didn't plan it. You went into the realm of Facebook just like you went to the grocery store without a shopping list. And you meandered around the aisles not knowing what you were looking for. And you stayed longer than you should have. Leisure time even, recreation is not a bad thing. But plan it in the same way that you plan to get up in the morning. If you don't set an alarm, you're not going to get up. While being rested is a good thing, loving sleep is not a good thing. That's actually condemned. Don't be, there's a difference between being rested and being lazy. Well, in the same way, plan your leisure. Not a bad thing to have downtime, not even necessarily a bad thing to be on Facebook, but cap it. Say to yourself, I'm going to go in at this time for 30 minutes and no more, and then when I'm done, I'm done, and I'm out. Or else you will find yourself wasting time. And if you have an app, a Twitter or Facebook app on your phone, I strongly suggest you delete them. Do not be at the beck and call of everybody all the time. It's just this temptation calling you, and it's sitting in your pocket all the time. And most of you know what I'm talking about. It can and will get a hold of you, and there's this temptation to just go in and just to be on it. A lot of superficiality in that realm. While it can be a tool for good, very often... It will suck the life right out of you. And on that note, be careful not to let others waste your time. Do not cast your pearls before swine. This is a lesson I'm still learning. Learn to discern the difference between earnestly contending for the faith and needlessly arguing with people that are there to waste your time. People that want to disagree for the sake of being disagreeable. They might look very similar from the onset. There's a time to vigorously refute the Jews, as Apollos did, and a time to earnestly contend for the faith, as Jude exhorted. And then there's a time to shake the dust off your feet and walk away like Jesus commanded. The moment you realize that's happening, disengage. It will become profitless. There, I, I, I'm telling you, take it from me personally, I've been involved in ego tennis matches. It's a ridiculous, frivolous waste of time. And I had to look back shamefully after the fact and say, boy, that was, what a waste. So learn from my mistakes, if nothing else. And trust me when I say there's a very real temptation to allow pride to take over and be involved in what becomes a personal dispute rather than contending for the faith. It's a very real temptation. Don't cast your pearls before swine. They will just waste your time. Discern what is a valuable contention, and what is a profitless wrangling. And on that note, may God spare us from being those who waste the time of others. Don't become the swine yourself. Spare yourself from needlessly engaging other people, from initiating contentions with people on some individual basis. Don't do it. It's a real temptation, and spare yourself from it. Don't tempt others by being a time waster yourself. May God help us to that end. If you want to see somebody who managed his time well, you should read The Life and Diary of David Brainerd, this edition edited by Jonathan Edwards. Um, The preface has Jonathan Edwards' famous 70 resolutions. When he was about 19 or 20 years old, he wrote a list of 70 ways he resolved to live his life. You would do well to read them. I'm going to read just a couple. Resolve never to do any manner of thing, whether in soul or body, less or more, but what tends to the glory of God. Nor be, nor suffer it, if I can possibly avoid it. 
resolved never to lose one moment of time, but to improve it in the most po profitable way I possibly can. Resolve never to lose a moment of time. Don't be busy for the sake of being busy. Remember, Peter and Mary and Martha are in the home of Martha. And Martha's busy with much serving, and she says, Lord, see, Mary, my sister, has left me to do all this by myself. Tell her to come help me. And Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you're troubled and worried about many things, but one thing is necessary, and Mary has chosen that. Don't be busy, even for the Lord, until you're busy sitting at the feet of Jesus. Again, it is the number one aspect of time management. Charles Spurgeon records a couple of quotes that we might otherwise never have we might otherwise never have heard of these people. A one Miss Barry and a one Mr. J. How they viewed devotional time. Being in the closet. Miss Barry used to say, I would not be hired out of my closet for a thousand worlds. Mr. J said, if the twelve apostles were living near you, and you had access to them, if this intercourse drew you from your closet, they would prove a real injury to your souls. What a profound comment. Who wouldn't want to learn from Peter, James, John, Paul, etc.? Everybody would. But if you had access to them and that dialogue, that interaction, drew you from personal devotional time, it would actually prove an injury to your souls. Don't let anyone or anything draw you from that time, not even the so-called work of the Lord. Because it is work that will worry you and bring anxiety unless you have sat first at the feet of Jesus. I can tell you personally, the times I have been most burdened, most anxious, and most spiritually dry are all the result of some mismanagement of devotional time. When reverse engineered, it was some misstep in devotion. Have you ever said, I'm just so busy, I'm too busy to pray this morning, I'm too busy to read this morning? A dearly departed saint, Miss Bonnie, used to say, she had an acronym for busy, buried under Satan's yoke. Be diligent, but don't be busy. Be devotional, and then do the work. But don't be busy, worried, and anxious about doing stuff. The devotion is supremely important. And so, commit your works to the Lord, and your plans or your thoughts will be established. Yes, may God give us... Uh, May we number our days or prepare our days that we might gain a heart of wisdom. And not say, as David Cassidy said on his deathbed, so much wasted time. It is God's time. Be aware of it. Be deliberate about how you use it. And above all else, be devotional with it. Until next time, God bless and Godspeed. Godspeed.